magic is found in every room where people connect over a shared purpose. In this weekly podcast, Luke, Hannah and Chris explore the role of purpose, courage, mindset and culture in every leader's quest for transformational performance. Hello and welcome to Magic in the Room. I'm Hannah Broadrood. And I'm Chris Province. And I'm Luke Freeman. And today is a big day for us. We have spent this entire season of Magic in the Room talking about intentional leadership. Every month has been a different topic connected to intentional leadership. And today begins our last month of this season. So our last topic is all about hope. And we've talked about clarifying our values, understanding our strengths, all sorts of other practical leadership skills that we believe people need to be more than just an accidental leader, but to be an intentional leader. And this one, there's a reason it's last. To me, it's kind of the culmination of what does it mean to lead, especially in today's world. We're going to have some interesting conversations this month about the state of hope uh, in the world of leadership right now, about some emerging trends, even around just is the world becoming nihilistic and the world of business and the workforce? How do we counter that? How do we lead with hope? But today we're going to dig into what we mean when we say hope, uh, what it is. There's actually some cool uh, formulas uh, about how as leaders we can create hope. So this whole month, as we talk through hope, you can, like every other month, go to magicintheroom.com and download your free guide. Uh, it's going to help you reflect and apply what we talk about to your life and to your leadership journey and role. So really excited to dig into it. So thank you, Luke. And uh, yeah, I'm excited as well, because isn't this ultimately what we're in it for, right? To create um, a better world and you know, having a way to get there. So what I thought we'd open up with is just really laying out what is hope and how it's defined. Yeah. I mean, really simply put, hope is just the belief that the future can be better and that we have the power to make it better. And that can apply to all sorts of different areas. Uh, As we were talking before hitting record, you know, We even talked about there are things that we can be very, very hopeful for that are pretty simple, right? After we're done recording the podcast, I'm very hopeful that I'm going to go inside and get coffee. And it's because I know how to make coffee, right? I want that future for later this morning, and I'm pretty sure I've got the agency to go and make that decision. And so for us as leaders, like that one's a pretty simple one. Uh, But then when we get into like organizational strategy, corporate activity, where things are happening, what our impact is in the wider world as an organization, uh, the ability for someone to have a career path with us and and be with us long term and really grow and develop, that all gets a little bit stickier. But it all really comes down to if people can have hope in any of those things, they're really just hope is just the belief that the future can be better. And people have the power to make it better. Yeah. And and I think recognizing those three things, right? We we have to be able to see that there is a better future. So have a vision for a future. That's that's a goal. Um some kind of realistic plan or a course of action for how we're going to achieve that goal. And then Luke, you already mentioned agency, that belief that you actually can do something about it that you have um, that you can make choices and you can take action and that it will impact the world or your situation for the better. Yeah, I think, you know, this whole idea of hope around a cup of coffee, right? I, I, there's a reason to be hopeful about that. It's It's typically localized. It's determined by me. It's something that I want to see happen. And um, now, like without actual coffee beans to grind or without the grind, there really is no pathway to make the coffee, right? Unless a neighbor has the coffee, right? But some sort of access to the actual product, right? Without that, there is no pathway. Therefore, it would become a wish, right? Mm, The absence of anything in the pathway makes hope a wish. There is no false hope. There's only hope and wishes uh, and when we're missing anything along the path, it's what 
kind of flips that switch, right? Because then I wish I had coffee. Therefore, I would make a cup if I did, right? But yeah. without that, it is not possible. So you can have the goal, you can have the agency, but without all the things in the pathway, it's just not possible. Yeah, and I think that's a really good call out, Chris, the difference between hope and wishful thinking, right? Hope and wishful thinking are not the same thing. Um, if you're if you're missing a pathway or the agency, you can wish for a better future, but there is no real concrete action that can come from that. Um, and yeah, I think I think it's interesting, and we're gonna break this down a little bit more here in a little bit. Um, but yeah, there's there's this book out there that was uh, touted in sales circles in in the 90s, early 2000s. Can't remember exactly the year, but it was called Hope is Not a Strategy. Mm -hmm. And what we now know, based on this research about hope and what it is, hope can, can and should absolutely be part of a strategy. Absolutely. I think it's just, I think a lot of it is just historically misunderstanding what it is yeah. right and, and but ultimately it's about this belief that the future will be better and we have the power to make it so so anytime as leaders we're looking to move things forward whether that's ourselves our teams our organizations our communities it's the future will be better we have the power to make it so and um, and it's about like becoming going from current state to a more ideal state to becoming a better version of ourselves. Um, so all these things about mindset and grit and so, just so much good stuff that we know from the leadership domain kind of rolls into this idea and culminates with hope being possible. Um, but there explicitly, there are things in our lives, in our teams, within, within our organizations that work against hope, right? So if hope is really this idea of playing offense, right? Driving things forward, moving towards where we want to be, they, there's this thing out there that's tackling us or playing defense against hope, right? And um, I have kind of a saying, and, and it's really not, I say it in jest, but it's certainly not a joke. And that is like cynics murder hope. And said another way, like cynicism murders progress. Yeah. Yeah. And so, Luke, I can you shine some light on cynicism and kind of how that plays against what we're trying to achieve within teams and organizations? Yeah. So cynicism, as you said, is the antithesis of hope. And we define it as an emotion of jadedness, emotions of negativity, uh, a general distrust of the integrity of other people, a general distrust of the motives of other people. So this jaded negativity, that's cynicism. And I think the challenge here is that as stewards of hope, as creators of hope, right, whatever you want to call the role of an intentional leader we are fighting against something that in cynicism has typically been earned honestly in our people. When they have a general distrust in the integrity or motives of others, it's because they have been taught to have a general distrust in the integrity or motives of others. When people feel those jaded emotions about the work that we do, about the organization of which we're a part. Typically, they've gotten that honestly. And so I think it's a it's a huge battle when we run into cynicism inside the organization because we're not just re we're not just teaching someone, oh, hey, look, we've got a goal and here's how we're going to get there. You should be hopeful about that. It really is. How do we redefine the rules of the game enough so that they're like, yep, I'm willing to play? I think as far as teammates go, right? It's this whole idea of, I'm not asking you to block for me, but please don't tackle me. 
And it seems like the trend that I see on high performance teams is that there is a clear lack of cynicism. When I can spend two days with a team and not run into a cynic, I typically am, am working in a high performance environment. And when there is a cynic around, they, I, it, they're easy to spot. It's within 10 minutes of meeting the person, you know, they're the one. They're the one that drags the team down. They're the one that's not supportive. They're the one that makes it five times harder than it needs to be to get any initiative pushed forward. They're the one that nobody really wants to go and talk to. And they do that on purpose so that, you know, any low performance behavior, they can avoid their manager getting in their chili, right? They, it, it, like, let's, we know these people. So Hannah, where do you see it? How do you see it? What are the, how do you know when you're engaged with a cynic? So first of all, I want to acknowledge there is a lot of cynicism out there and, and it resonates when we travel around the country and talk about these concepts of intentional leadership and especially this session about hope. Um, it resonates with the audience when you, when you talk about cynicism, people nod, they, they look around, they, they see it all around them. Typically, the people that are in our classes are the less cynical, and those individuals get an earful of cynicism often from peers who don't understand or somehow feel threatened by the fact that this individual chose to take this class, because that's often how this is, you know, in, in different organizations, you know, we when people have the opportunity to opt in to take a class to develop themselves, there's something hopeful about that, right? And that person chooses hope. And there are others who are not choosing hope, right? And peers have to kind of fight against that, right? Because that's that's the attitude. So it definitely resonates. For me, the hopeful message is that hope is the antidote to cynicism. And so if we're going to combat or or at the very best neutralize cynicism as a threat to performance and progress, hope is the only answer. So for me, it just keeps coming back to rather than dwelling on the cynicism, how can I instill more hope? How can I be a champion of hope? How can I teach others to be champions of hope? Yeah, and in that, I want to call out and give us permissions as leaders to have conversations with our team members about hope and what we're here to accomplish, right? If I think about the four supreme objectives of business, they keep our current customers, get new customers, increase the spend of, of existing customers without putting number one in danger and always becoming more efficient. Like it's this idea of constant forward progress. And I think carrying those super objectives into a conversation with hope is helpful, right? Because we can say, look, our super objectives here are to do these things. We also are charged with activating our purpose and living by these commitments because we're part of this work community. And um, these are the things that when you take the role that you're serving in and the responsibilities that you have, and how you're supposed to move us forward, there's a lot of reason for us to be hopeful. You have all the tools that you need in order to help us be successful. Um, now, in order to do that, we have to go about things a certain way, you know, with positivity, with knowing this is possible, staying focused on the goals. And when I hear complaints, negativity, jadedness, when I hear these things coming from you, whether in email or in a conversation or other team members coming to me, it makes, it allows me to know that we are not fulfilling our obligations. So when, when you are negative, you are working against the goals of our team. 
you're working against what we're charged to do. And this is me letting you know that those behaviors being present on this team will never be okay. And I expect these behaviors to end now because it does not meet our standard for what is culturally acceptable. And in this conversation, I can do a corrective action. I can fill out a form, right? But I think there's some language for leaders to use, whether they want to just coach or move someone down the path of corrective action. I know this is the first time we've talked about this formally, so I'm going to go ahead and document this as a step one. I don't expect we're going to have to talk about it again, but just in case this does become a trend or an ongoing issue, I wanted to get this you know, kind of on the table and us deal with it directly. Um, and then you come back if, if it continues to happen. You, you know, This step two conversation is more along the lines of, hey, I know we've talked about this before. I want to reiterate these objectives and our purpose and our community guidelines. And what really concerns me is that this is the second time we've talked about it, and now it's a trend. I don't want to believe that this is the type of person that you are that would continue to hold our team back from where we're trying to go. But it is how the team is experiencing you. It's how I'm experiencing you as someone responsible for supporting you. And I hope we don't have to have this conversation again. Okay, now I move to step three. You know, we've had this conversation twice before about negativity, cynicism, kind of not respecting or holding our guidelines or purpose or objectives in regard. Um, you know, the first couple of times we talked about it, I was hopeful that it wouldn't be a trend, but being this is the third occurrence of this same conversation, I'm beginning to think this is something that you have a real challenge with. So now I can introduce the concept of EAP if I'm interested in like moving the, that uh, employee or team member towards development or ther therapeutic type remedy or I can just treat it as a performance issue. And if I treat it like a performance issue, here's what I'd say. You know, I see that you are having a lot of difficulty changing this behavior. I, I can assure you this behavior cannot continue on our team. If this is a behavior you can't curtail, then I would suggest that you go ahead and resign. Because the next time we have this conversation, that will not be on your terms. So I'm giving you the opportunity today. If you cannot change this behavior, I will accept your resignation. But if you believe you can, let's go forward. But understand that next time we have the conversation, it's not a conversation at all. Your time with our team is just over. So... Anyway, I, not something we've talked about on the podcast before, but I thought something that may be helpful on how to deal with cynicism um, and kind of move team members towards hope. Yeah, and what I like about that conversation is that people throw the word culture around quite a bit and they say, oh, we've got a great culture around here. Oh, our culture is that we work hard. Oh, da, 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 da. What I like about hope is that since we know <clears throat> hope is clear goals, a pathway to meet those goals, and that we have the power to walk that path and make it so, saying we have a hopeful culture like means something. So I think if you're a leader who says, yeah, like I, I want to have a good culture, I want to build a go good culture, like culture is a squishy word. It's a soft word. You've got to figure out what do you mean by that? And I think the word hope and the concept of hope can be a useful tool in this place, in this organization, on this team, we have a culture of hope, which means that we believe that tomorrow can be better than today. We do the work to create the plans to get us there. And like everyone's empowered to do it and invited to do it and walk those paths. So that I like I like that because it's it's not soft. And Chris, as you walk through that performance management conversation, that corrective action conversation, 
Like people need to know that you can hold folks accountable for social behavior in a way that is clear. It doesn't have to just be, well, that's just your opinion. Well, it's not in the in the handbook or in the policy. Like we can say no. We have a culture of hope. Here's what you're doing that is cynical. Absolutely. And it's uh I just wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about like how cynics work against what we're trying to do. And so taking it back to hope, Hannah, like talk to me a little bit about where do we find it? Right. We say it's a good thing. It's, you know, let's pull a little bit of thread. Like where, where as leaders, can we find hope? Yeah. I think that begins with understanding what hope is. And we um, define find it earlier as, you know, this future will or can be better and that you have the power to make it so. And that it requires these three things, right? We got to have goals, pathways, and agency. Um, sometimes, you know, hope appears and we feel hopeful. When we understand what hope really is, I think we can look for hope and we can create hope. And it could be as simple as starting with Luke's example of saying, okay, here's something I do have reason to feel hopeful about. I'm going to get some coffee when we're done with this conversation. A little bit of hope infuses some hope that, okay, in this area, my future can be better. And it creates this positive spiral. When we can find something as even as small as getting coffee to feel hopeful about, that sense of hope can become fuel to look for hope in something maybe a little bit bigger. So I'll use a current example for me. So I've talked about my journey with running a lot on this podcast. And I've had some injuries and some health issues that the summer and the season that are not, I'm not used to and that are different. And so it's kept me from doing the thing, you know, for, from running. Even yesterday, I went on a walk with a dog and afterward, my foot was hurting. And this morning, it's hurting. And I woke up this morning see, feeling not very hopeful about being able to run again because my foot's always hurting now when I when I go. Um, and so for me, that means how can I look for something to be hopeful about, right? Maybe there is some kind of treatment I can try. Maybe there is, you know, physical therapy or some exercises, right? So for me, it means looking for hope so that I can be able to run again. And I think that's an act. It, it starts with a choice, right? Choosing that I'm going to do something about it. And that's our whole definition of intentional leadership. If we are intentional as leaders, we notice that something could be better, meaning there's some cynicism or we don't feel very hopeful. Um, we can choose to do something about that, right? We can look for pathways and we can build agency. And I think that's the tricky one, right? How do you build agency and how do you increase your agency so that you have more of that sense of personal power of the ability to do and accomplish? Um, so, yeah, so I think finding hope is an exercise in intentional leadership, noticing, choosing, and then taking action that is hopeful and not cynical. I want to jump in here, Hannah, and speak to, as it relates, I, I want to start talking about how we increase or like, how do we expand the idea of on becoming more hopeful, right? And, and I want to speak to, in your world, let's talk about injury, right? Um, I'm, I'm, I've always been really drawn to the idea of implementation intent because as I sit here and look, if I'm injured, I think about the, the big path or like how I, I automatically jump to the end of no longer feeling hurt or being injured 
And that is a very, especially after you've experienced it for a long time, they, the idea of not having that feeling and the work required to get there can be daunting, yeah. right? Or maybe it's, I don't, I don't have a degree, but I know I need a degree and it's 126 hours and it's, you know, seven years if I'm a working professional and like, that's daunting. I'm, I, I go from where I am all the way to the end state instead of following a pathway in like that implementation intent. And so I think one of the ways we can increase hope is by breaking down that long journey into very manageable parts. Like if I'm going to correct an injury, the first thing that I might need to do is understand who specializes in this type of injury in my particular area. You know, like just one step, that's it. The only thing I need to worry about or if I'm looking to go to school, all I need to do is understand what entrance exam or pre-entrance requirements may exist. Like I haven't even taken the, the screening exam to then apply, to then be accepted, to then enroll, to ultimately get in a class, let alone 40 classes, right? Yeah. So I, I just think one of the ways we can increase agency is to really break down those pathways and it makes it more likely we're going to achieve the goal. Right. Yeah. And I love how you started with this, you know, vision of an end state. And, Cause I think, I mean, that is where it starts, right. Having this vision of a better future. So yeah, maybe, maybe you're someone who didn't finish high school and that path seems even longer and more daunting because not only do you have to, you know, take whatever courses and, and hours required to get a college degree, if that's your goal, you now also have a bunch of other stuff to, to make up um, just to meet the minimum requirement to even start on that journey. And yeah, if we can get inspired by a better future, that can give us that impetus to start to look for the pathways and yeah, then breaking it down into smaller chunks that are bite-sized that we can take on. If we, you know, with anything that we start, um, unless we can break it down into manageable pieces, we're going to lose hope pretty quickly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we kind of talked about loop there, how to increase hope via pathway. Let's I'd like, let's pull some thread on how we increase hope by expanding agency. So can I, if you would drop some knowledge on me about how can we expand really the number of things to be hopeful about? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. And I think this is one of the primary functions of leadership. Do I really believe that? I think I believe that. I think expanding the agency of the people that we work with and lead, yeah, is maybe one of the just two or three, if you really boil it down, things that leaders do. And I'll give an, an example, like the coffee thing. I clearly have the agency to do that. Um, even if I had to go buy coffee in a grinder, I could do that. I could make that happen. Like agency isn't a problem. Um, and then there are clearly things in our world that we don't have agency over. Let's call it like the tax code. Sure, if you're a huge corporation, maybe you can get a lobbyist and have some, like maybe you can do something about it. But for most of us, we don't have any agency over how taxes are calculated. Um, foreign war and conflict. There's nothing we can do about that. Most individuals, right? Maybe in two years, we can vote for the leader that we think is going to make a better decision, right? That's, But that's it. But in between those things, in between the coffee and the kind of global issue piece, there's a whole lot of gray area. And the gray area is are, are things like, can we launch a new product? <laughs> can we have a different atmosphere in our community. 
can we I, I mean just think about the things that that are right there on the edge things that feel local maybe state wide issues that we face as as business leaders uh, if we're in a large organization things that are big if we're in a small organization things that are like how do we go to market how do we leverage technology what's happening with technology those are things that we should be really discerning which of these issues which of these decisions does my team feel like are happening to them but in reality we might be able to guide and have influence on if we think about it differently and that's kind of on the macro scale on the smaller individual scale team member over there you know who joined our team three years ago and is really struggling with this performance issue or this deliverable or this project or product can they actually feel more agency to make decisions regarding that. And I think thinking about it that way, rather than always focusing on, well, let's just make a plan. All right, what are we going to do? What are our goals for next quarter? All right, let's put resource there. Like if we don't address the agency driver behind all of that, like people's real belief of if they can make a change or not, then it's going to be difficult. And here's the deal. We've all experienced our agency being uh, grown, being expanded by other people. The best keynote that you've ever been to, the best sermon you've ever heard, the best conference you've attended. When you left there feeling hope, a piece of that was someone helped you feel like you had more power than you did when you walked in. Someone said, you can make a choice here that has an impact. And we don't have to be great speakers. We don't have to be the best motivators in the world. But we as leaders need to be expanding the feeling of power of our team members. What I hear in that, Luke, is that there are specific things that leaders can do that can help put the conditions in place so that people can have, have more agency, just like, you know, agency is by definition is something that you have to believe about yourself, that you have the power to do something about it. But the people around us are incredibly influential in forming and shaping that belief the experiences that we have in life are influential in forming that belief. In my former life working in sales organizations, you know, a big strategy when we got new salespeople on board was to, you know, help them get some quick wins. And that was for the very reason that you described, Luke, to help them gain a sense of agency. Oh, okay, I can make this sale. I can um make progress on this big goal that i have right and part of that was intentional on on the leaders and what kind of accounts they gave that new person what sales opportunity they brought them along in and helped them be part of closing right so they got right off the bat that experience of i have agency i can make an impact i can uh, make progress, right? And I think those are the things, you know, it's like that quote about, uh, it's been attributed to Einstein. I can't teach people anything. All I can do is create the conditions and where where learning is possible. And I, I think they're very concrete things, just the same, that we can create the conditions where agency can grow. We can inspire people towards a better future. We can show them the path. We can allow them to feel like they're making progress. And I think there's, you know, intentional leaders have a big role in that. Yeah, that's, it's interesting. I'm, I'm thinking, Hannah, as you were working through that, it's this idea of agency shows up for me, if I'm trying to put words around it, I've got to be confident, 
courageous and competent. You know, they, it, as I level up my competency, my agency is improved because I'm able to do more things. Right. And now just because I'm able, am I willing to share that and make the space better for a team or an organization or a community? Right. Because I may be confident in my ability, but I don't, I'm not willing to be judged based on that. So that the courage to go out and actually make it so. So it, it's building the competence, having the confidence in that ability and having the courage to put it on display. Um, and how do we help other people? I think it's certainly helpful to understand competency modeling and how we kind of love people through a place of incompetence to competence. This is also where as a leader, when we're moving people through, it's they really need our love and authenticity. So how do we increase hope and agency for the people we're supporting, like loving them through that bridge of non incompetence to competence, but we have to be really authentic in our approach to that. So I think those are some ways that we can increase agency of others, the people that we lead are within our teams. Um, but I, I thought maybe I want to speak to how to increase our individual agency answering this question. How can we expand the number of things we can be hopeful about a couple of things we've talked about earlier in this season, growth mindset, outward mindset, like build my skills, give them away, right? Whatever I have being willing to give it away for the, for the benefit of others. But I want to work through in practical terms what this can look like in, in forms of when I think about modeling agency, like how do I build agency? And one, like being properly energized, right? If, if you have low energy, you're probably going to have low, low agency. So can it really what leaders have to think about, especially intentional leaders, sleep, nutrition, exercise, how do I create and spend white space? You know, what is the kind of higher, mm -hmm. highest level information I'm taking in, like our podcast, right? This kind of that umbrella or global level information. What am I consuming? But then there's this idea based on what I consume, the the keynote that I hear, Luke, and I am I willing to go into some sort of role exploration around that idea? Like, is, is this idea a role that I want to explore? So I'm looking at this new role or a new way of doing, and I'm building some contextual knowledge. I'm starting to understand, does this new way of doing or does this new role fit for my lifestyle? Is it fit for something that I want to do? What's the measure of my ability? I mean, just because I go listen to a keynote and they say, you know, running is going to increase my lifespan and leadership effectiveness is is my ability there or do i have an injury or maybe it's something chronic that would limit my ability to perform in this particular role and then like do i enjoy it like why you know these are just as i'm exploring a role that's when i'm making these kind of assessments and if they clear those hurdles like i've got some contextual knowledge it fits i'm i'm reasonably good at it i feel like i can build competency it's something i enjoy these are all, it's kind of like a low investment of resource before I move to that next step, which is role acceptance, right? So, because once I accept the role, now I'm submitting to the discipline. I'm really creating expectations around my performance in this area. I'm getting deep knowledge, not surface knowledge. I'm, I'm really diving in to understand the domain that I'm accepted. I'm <clears throat> putting my development path around the role in place, committing resources, tooling up. I'm moving from the you know twenty dollar tennis racket to the hundred and sixty dollar tennis racket. Right? I'm, I'm investing more uh, in the tools themselves, and you know my my physical resources, my time uh, as I increase my technical knowledge. So that's what you know, and I'm. After I accept the role, I'm working towards mastery. But 
what I've got to do now is say, how intensely do I want to fulfill this role? Because it might be taking tennis. I might want a thousand dollar tennis racket in the country club membership and, you know, or I want to go play on the seniors tour. I, you know, it's for every person to determine, but I, I think this idea of having appropriate energy, exploring the role for fit and ability, accepting the role and committing to developing mastery so that I can then determine what level of intensity I'm play, I'm fulfilling this role or I'm playing this role. Where Basically, where does it fit into my life allocation of resource and time? But then once we arrive at this place of being able to do of like high competency, and I know that I can fill this role, and that's what informs that grit, right? And, and really says, um, hey, you know, you can do hard things and you can make this happen over again. And this is your path to building more agency. Um, but what it feels like is once we get to that level of mastery and we go through this process, to me, that's where freedom comes in. I think that's a little bit about agency we haven't really talked about is once we have agency, you now have freedom to make the cup of coffee. You have freedom to go run 5K or 10K or a marathon. It, you, you are free to do things. You have sovereignty when you explore roles, develop deep knowledge, work towards mastery. And like when we sit on our ass and wait for the world to come to us, then we bitch about not having freedom. Like the, the, there should be no expectations of people having sovereignty if we're not willing to explore new roles. So I, one, I wanted to share the model. Two, I wanted to give it to you all and say, what do you think or feel about all of that? I mean, the thing that really resonates in that model to me is this idea of when it when we make the switch to whatever the skill or the thing is that we are pursuing becoming a part of our identity. I'm going to make this kind of meta here, but I want to say for folks who are going through leadership journey and saying, am I a leader? Am I an intentional leader? How do I become a leader? Like there is a point in there where you have to take the mantle on and say, I identify as a leader that is going to leave this world better than how I found it. I think once we've identified that way, is that this is part of who I am at my core, part of what I'm devoting my life to. In a lot of ways, it becomes easier to say, okay, well, now I have to learn how to create hope in cultures of cynicism. Now I have to learn how to coach instead of just direct. Now I have to learn how to prioritize. Now I do have to learn how to be sustainable, right? Manage my own well-being so that I can do this for the long haul. Like there's a choice in there around, am I a leader that's going to leave this world better than I found it? And, you know, for folks listening, I hope that today is a great opportunity for that to happen. For you to be able to say, I want to be an agent of hope in a world that, from my perspective anyway, is increasingly hopeless. We need people who are going to put on that mantle and say, this is who I am and this is going to be part of my life's work. Absolutely. And any thoughts? Yeah, I think, I mean, for me, just having this conversation helps instill some hope. I'm, I'm inspired for the future. And as we think about, you know, what you described, um, Chris, about, you know, the roles that we explore and the roles that we take on You know, to Luke's point, when we choose to accept the role of a leader, yeah, what what does that actually mean? How do we become champions of hope? How do we infuse more hope into our lives and our own families? How do we infuse more hope into our organizations that we lead? And um, hope is we've already we've already said it it's the antidote to cynicism to nihilism to all the negativity in the world 
And I do think that hope is something that it fluctuates, right? Some days I feel more hopeful than other days. Uh, in some areas, I feel more hopeful than in other areas. And yeah, can I envision a future that is better? And who? Then you do that. I think that's another, you know, takeaway for me too. Like, who are the people in our lives that help us be more ho hopeful? How do we surround ourselves with them? Because every leader needs hope too. Yeah, that's that's really strong. And, and I think knowing who those people are, right? Maybe it's a hey, when I when I feel a little bit low on hope, these are the people that help. And when I feel really low on hope, here's here's the people I have to be around, yeah. right? And um, I, I think having that inventory is helpful, or at least knowing where we can go as leaders, right, to seek that support. Um, but yeah, I, I'll kind of wrap it all up to say, like, at the end of the day, am I a person that believes that tomorrow can be better? In, in that, do I believe in the power of positive potential that we just, we don't know until we know, right? And, and, and do I see myself as an agent and advocate for hope? Because the way, the way I see myself influences how I see the world. And in turn, that influences how I live. So ultimately, how I see myself determines how I live out and live into messages and actions of hope. And, it, it, you know, we always say, oh, this is always an inside job, right? So I'm the first person that has to believe in me in that... I can be part of a better tomorrow. So that's kind of my, my last takeaway. And I, th I think I'm going to just open up here and say, before we sign out, any, any last thoughts? We need it. We need it. What's the alternative? Yeah. Right. I mean, we know how our stories end. All of our stories are going to end the same way. So there's this question of what quality of life do we want to live and be a part of for other people before the final chapter, right? Before the book closes. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, I would argue that as individuals, we need to understand how to be hopeful and live hopeful lives. And I need a community of people. I want, I'm greedy, right? I want more than just me. I want all these leaders in my community, in my state, in my country, in the world to authentically be builders of hope. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for me, the only way to get there is like, I have to do it first. If I don't do it first, I can't expect anyone else to do it. Yeah. But if I start first, like I have some level of hope that we can leave the place that we found a little bit better than when we found it. So, but that's a choice. That's me. That's what I want. And I think for everyone listening, like, what do you want and what's your role going to be in it? And that's the big question. That's often the hardest question, Luke. What, what do I want? And what do I want the future to look like? Because that's where it all starts. And I think that's my final thought is I invite you to spend some time today, this week of envisioning that better future. For me, it's going to be, yeah, what will it look like and feel like when I no longer am battling these injuries and I can run or do the things that I, I love to do 
Like what, what will that look like and feel like? Maybe it's, you know, once you get that degree, what are the choices that are available to you? What, how will your life, your life be different or better? Or for your family, if you're able to maybe after this promotion, how will your life be better or different in some way? What choices and decisions are you able to do to make to be able to take care of your family in a different way? Or if you start this company, how will the future look different or better? And so that's my part of parting. Think about what does an inspiring future look like and feel like, and what will you be able to do? Um, that's where hope starts. Yeah. Well, thank you, Hannah. And I just want to remind all the, all of our listeners, if they want to follow along this journey of hope over this last season or last month of our intentional leadership season, uh, there is a guide at magicintheroom.com available for download. Uh, also, feel free to check us out here at uh, Purpose and Performance Group. We're, we're at purposeandperformancegroup.com. You can follow our company on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, and also, as, if you're a listener, please leave a review. Let us know how we're doing. Let us know the value that you find in these conversations. And we're really thankful for you all joining us here today. Um Magic in the Room is hosted by Chris Province, Hannah Broderud, and Luke Freeman. It's produced by Ben West, and our social media is managed by Emma Holland and Maggie King Robinson. Our theme music is by Evan Grimm. Be sure to check out his music on Apple Music. And Magic in the Room is a production of Purpose and Performance Group, where you can find us again at purposeandperformancegroup.com and all of our previous episodes on magicintheroom.com. Until next time, thank you all.